Well, good morning. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here with you this morning as we uh, dive into this series with you. Uh, yes, my name is Jason. I, I work with a ministry called Project 619. And um, the great thing is, if you weren't uh, a part of the Parenting in a Sexually Charged World workshop, the, the thing that you should know is that Marabu Chapel has actually been a partner with us for quite some time, not just through the workshop, but your youth pastor, Kyle Kingsley, has for many years spoken um, on our behalf in the public schools. So Central Valley High School, U- University High School, um, have benefited from him leaving these four walls, going into the school and, and serving uh, in, in a wonderful and awesome way by diving into the conversations around sex, sexuality, uh, life choices, media discernment. And, and so m- for many years, he's, he's uh, uh, graciously given of his time. Your church has given of, of its time of Kyle to be able to go and speak in the schools, which has been such a blessing. So hundreds, if not thousands of students uh, here in the Spokane Valley and now throughout the region, maybe throughout the country and the rest of the world, have been impacted by him going and sharing, and that is because of you. So thank you so much for, for being a partner with this ministry. You know, I, I started Project 619. I did not grow up thinking I'm going to grow up and talk about sex and sexuality. That was like not my goal when I was a teenager, <laughs> right? Like I, I, I had something completely different in mind. But somehow God uh, took my story and then turned it into what is now a, a thriving ministry of, of diving into the conversations around uh, Christ-centered sexuality. And that's what I've had the privilege of doing for almost 20 years now. And, and these conversations are important. Uh, they are radically shifting in our culture, and so we need to be able to be encouraged, equipped, uh, empowered to speak on this. Because what I know is that so often the conversations or the reality of how sex and sexuality have played out in our own lives can often bring us to a place where we're stuck. And what I love about this ter- series is it's about getting unstuck See, for me, um, I became sexually active at 16, made a choice to start over at 21, but it was because of the, the, the reality of Jesus entering into my life, the love of Jesus entering into my life, that, that I began the work of radically transforming, or rather the Holy Spirit radically transforming the way in which I saw the world and the way in which I lived in this world. And it's that story that has really shaped what has become Project 619, as, as we dive into the conversation around sex, what I often believe is it's an opportunity to point to the one that created sex. And that's what we have the privilege of doing this morning. In fact, here's the thing. I, I want for us to be able to, since we're going to dive into a conversation around sex, we should probably at least be able to say it in church. I know we don't often speak it. Maybe it's in a hushed tone. But uh, I want for us to be able to speak it. If you've heard me speak before, I often have my audience uh, speak the word sex out loud. So we're going to do that this morning. Yes, I know it's Sunday. So on the count of three, with great gusto, uh, I would love for you to say this word sex out loud. Ready? One, two, three. Yes. Excellent. Some of you are more excited than others. That's okay. (laughs) Now, here's what I know about uh, Sunday morning. You you have come. You're ready to learn. And I look at your faces, and and they're, you know, being a public speaker or being on stage sometimes is always an awkward thing because I get to look and experience how you listen. And sometimes when you're listening, I I get these faces that look much like this. (laughs) And then when I prepare an audience to say the word sex, though, it's funny how faces go from this to this, right? There's a little bit of a smirk, a smile. Our countenance begins to change. And then we also revert to like our second grade self, right? Like we we do this giggle, (laughs) right? Like like all of a sudden something happens. And here's what I wanna wanna point to. I, I think that there is something divine. I think there is something beautiful. I think there is something needed about this conversation, about us being able to speak honestly about it. What I know is this, is that with this term, this idea, this act, this thing of sex, it comes with joy and celebration, but it can also come with great pain and heartache and shame. And shame, friends, is, is this, this idea of being a known or thinking that I am a mistake. That's different than guilt or conviction, which is I made a mistake. Those are two separate things. And I think that the work of the devil is to make us think that we are a mistake, but we are not a mistake, right? And we must be able to understand that. God placed great value in humans when he created them. 
So we have to be able to understand that because if we're going to get unstuck, we have to understand God's great love for us in the midst of this and God's great plan for this very particular thing. And so today what I want to do is I want to look at a particular verse that, that plays out in Scripture. It's one that we're familiar with. I know it's probably one that we've addressed here at this church, but I think it's one to be reminded of. Now, it comes from John chapter 8. It actually begins in verse 7 and goes to verse 11. Uh, it's important to be able to, to recognize as you turn to your devices that one of the things that happens in this uh, section is that this was not a part of the original tran- uh, transcripts, the original manuscripts that were, that were ri- the original gospel of John. They, they were added later, but here is what we do know, that it has not been refuted, that this is a part of the, the story of Jesus, that most likely it might not have been John, but it might have been Luke who wrote this. I don't want to focus too much attention on that, but I do need to say that because it's important if we're going to dive honestly into Scripture that we at least look at some of the realities of what we're studying. And most likely it was placed where it was placed because of some some other stories that were leading up to this very place, this very time, uh, and then continue on. And we'll also look at that here in a moment. But this is a story that includes real people, real places, real circumstances. And when we're reading Scripture, when we're, we're, we're leading ourselves into what is happening, it's often important for us to be able to place ourselves in the midst of what is occurring, especially in the Gospels. It's so rich. And sometimes what I find is the best way for me to engage in what we are reading is to actually place myself in that situation as if I were a bystander, as if I were one of the characters. So read with me. Chapter, John chapter 8, starting in verse 2, we will go to verse 11. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him. And this is Jesus. He sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the very act of adultery. But in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing them. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. I mean, this is such a a beautiful story. It's it's a story that is told many times. And, And I think it's something that we can easily enter into. There are many characters in this. Yes, there is Jesus. Yes, there is the woman that is caught in the act of adultery, which we have to be able to point to. It says caught in the act of adultery, which means she's most likely naked, right? Like she, if you were caught in the act of adultery, it means that they, they took her from the very act of having sex and most likely all she has, if anything, is a, uh, maybe a, a, a blanket or something that she was able to grab as, as the Pharisees were grabbing her and taking her into the temple courts. I mean, think of the, the reality of how this woman felt. Not only did she feel naked physically, she probably felt naked emotionally, right? Her sin was on display. But then you also have the Pharisees who are coming with anger, contempt, trying to trap Jesus. You have the individuals that are learning from Jesus. They are circled around Jesus. This rabbi, this new rabbi, they're learning these words. And then come the Pharisees, who many of these people that circled Jesus knew, had grown up with, had sat under their teaching for quite some time. And then you also had the passerbyers, right? Like if you were in the temple, most likely there were other people doing other business and they were passing by. But what happens when there's a commotion? Right, if you were in high school and a fight broke out, you didn't like run the other way. Most likely, you ooh, right? Or if like you're in the middle of a mall and something begins to occur and someone is arguing, what do you do? You you stop and you watch. Or now in our day and age, we get out our phone and record it, right? <laughs> like there there is something that that happens, and so all of these individuals are now engaging in the very story that Jesus and this woman are having almost by themselves. See, there's something that happens in this, and the first thing is this: Jesus humbles himself. Jesus humbles himself. I mean, we see this over and over again in Scripture where Jesus does this thing where he humbles himself before the other. I think that's something that we most often want is we want to be seen and heard. It's a part of our creation is to be known and to be loved. It's a part of our DNA. 
You don't even need to turn to Scripture. You can look to government studies that are showing we, somewhere in our DNA, have a desire to be connected to each other and, more importantly, to a higher source, a divine spirit. Yes, God. But Jesus humbles himself. It's so incredibly moving. And it's not just in what he says. No, it's in what he does with his bodies. You know, 90% of the way we communicate is in the way that we move our body, the way we engage in the conversation around us. And what does Jesus do? I love this. John 8, 6, it says, he bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. He's on the ground. He's getting lower than this woman. To humble yourself literally translates, or the meaning of it is to get on the ground. That's what Jesus is doing. Now, some uh, uh, have argued about what Jesus is writing, and, and I, I, for the, the purpose of this morning, we don't need to dive into it. I, I don't even know if it's as important as this, what is happening with his posture and what is happening in the moment around them. But there is a dynamic that you have to be able to understand and why this manuscript might have been placed here. If he's writing with his finger, it means he was probably literate. literate uh, being literate in this day and age was not something that, that, that uh, uh, many people were able to, to read and write. So it was, it, was, it, was, it was surprising, especially for him. If you go back to John 7, 15, and this is why they most likely think that this was placed here, uh, the Pharisees questioned how he was a learned individual, whether he was really learned. And here he is, he's writing on the ground. There is something so much more here. What is he doing? His posture is getting lower than this woman. And this is in a culture where men would wake up and give thanks for not being made a woman. This is a culture where if you were a woman, you were treated as a second class citizen. This is a culture where if you were caught in the midst of sexual sin, specifically if you were a woman, you were even treated worse. Many of the laws around adultery were more so that the man could divorce his wife, not so much so the woman could divorce her husband. This is the culture in which we, we see during this time, and what do we see Jesus doing? He is getting lower than the woman. Because it says that she was standing, made her stand before Jesus, and he is getting down on the ground. He is going to the ground. He's humbling himself. His posture is one that is allowing for her in the midst of her nakedness to in some way, without words being shared, to be seen and to be heard. And this isn't the only time Jesus humbles himself. He does this over and over again. John chapter 4, verses uh, 4 through 90, this happens with the woman that at the well now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sakar, near the, blot, the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. I mean, here is Jesus, right? He's sitting on the ground. She's about, he's asking her for water. And, and, and what, what's happening here, right? She is a Samaritan. She is a woman. And we also learn that she too is also someone that is caught in the midst of sexual sin. Yet Jesus is humbling himself. So powerful. Can I just say this? Because you might be asking, well, how does that play out for us? See, here's the deal. Each of us comes with our own baggage. Each of us and the reason we have to talk about sex is sexually broken. The reason we have to talk about this is because each and every one of us in here is sexually tempted. Yes, that temptation looks different one from the next, but we have to be able to have honest conversations. The reason we have to be able to say this word sex out loud is because we have to be able to be in a place like this where Jesus is center, where we can have an honest dialogue and we see it modeled. But we have to first be able to humble ourselves so that we can Come before the Lord. And that looks different for each person. For me, it was admitting to my own past sexually, saying I, I had messed around from 16 till I was 21 and made a choice to start over. And it wasn't just humbling myself and owning up to the mistakes that I had made, but it was also me then going and asking for forgiveness from the people that I had had sex with. For others, it's an issue with pornography. We live in a culture where pornography runs rampant. 
We are in an age where it's an epidemic. It is having profound impact, so much so that governments are now calling it a public health crisis. And it's not that we go looking for pornography. Pornographers spend billions of dollars to come and find us. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Why? Because pornographers are going to do their best to find you. And with technology the way it is today, it's going to find you. And see, here's the way that we are created. So often we forget that we were created with God's good intent, that that sex and the naked human body was this thing we were to look upon and say, good. But so often what pornography does is it distorts that good. See, we are to be drawn to the naked human body, but it's to be the one that we are to spend our life with. That is to be the staple of beauty. But what becomes the staple of beauty is an image that's on a screen. And it transforms and changes the way we interact with ourselves, with others, with a community around us. For some of us, it's looking at porn habitually. For some of us, it's an addiction. And then let's even get more honest here. For some of us, it might be extramarital affairs. It might be things that are happening outside the bounds of our own marriage. We need to be able to humble ourselves. It is a scary, scary experience. But it all depends, too, on how we see Jesus. See, when I was uh, growing up, I had a buddy that had an image of Jesus, and uh, I used to call it Death Ray Jesus. Now, I know that if we were to study this picture, there's probably a significant aspect of this image, and you know, there's this uh, ray of light that's coming upon this nun. But when I saw this image, it wasn't like this holy experience. It was like Jesus has a death ray coming out of his chest, and he is getting a nun. Like the, the a nun is like the picture of holiness, right? When I'm a teenager, I'm thinking like a nun is so pure and so good, right? And here is Jesus like striking her with a ray, and he's like, "Pew, gotcha, sister!" Ha <laughs> ha. And, right? and I used to think that Jesus was like, you are so bad, I'm going to get you with a ray, right? Like, like, I didn't know much about the faith then, but this image, for me, was the image of Jesus I had. It wasn't the one that we see here in John 8. It wasn't of uh, Jesus that was humbling himself and getting lower than her. That's not the image I had, but that is the image that we see. And that image has led me and has led others over time to be able to humble ourselves and to, in the darkest places of our soul, to be able to admit and bring into the light what has happened in our lives. See, what I know is this. Sex, oftentimes, and the way we've treated it, uh, it, it can lead to other aspects of the way we live our life. Uh, one quick word. If you have not come to a place where you have um, entered into, accepted, and asked for forgiveness from the things that have happened in your own life, Please do so, because if you are a parent or you are a grandparent, you will, you will engage in parents and grandparents out of that experience. And if there is pain and there is shame and there is harm and there is hurt, that will be extended. Please do not allow that to happen. Because we have the opportunity to, to humble ourselves just like Jesus humbled himself. But then Jesus does something else. He fronts with love. Jesus fronted with love. This has happened throughout Scripture. God is in the business of fronting with love, and so often we forget that. You know, uh, when you come back to this very uh, uh, experience that Jesus was having with this woman and everyone else around them, uh, we we see this. I want to come back to verse 7. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up, which uh, essentially when you translate this means to stand erect. He, he, He went from being on the ground and drawing getting lower than the woman, to standing up. Because now he's addressing the Pharisees. It's interesting. Posture changes. He's now addressing the Pharisees. And let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. It goes further. Again, he stooped down, went back down. Again, now he's addressing the woman. And rode on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? You know, it's so easy for us to also think that Jesus is just fronting with love for the woman, but I actually think that he's also fronting with love for every other person that's experiencing this. You know, a parent will often create, uh, will correct a behavior, and the child might be upset about that, but what we find is that um, the reason we are correcting that behavior, the thing that we want is, is we want them to change their behavior because we love them. 
And the way that Jesus is responding, the posture that he takes with the Pharisees and maybe with everyone else around them is they want them to change the way that they are thinking about this. Want the Pharisees to move from the anger to a reality of, of uh, an acceptance of, of this love that is available to us in God. Uh, for the persons that were sitting around Jesus, most likely they had grabbed a rock. They were waiting for Jesus to command them to throw the stone. Remember, the people that surrounded Jesus had sat under the tutelage of many of these Pharisees. They knew them by name. And they were prepared to throw the stone. They were just waiting for Jesus to give the command. But then it says this, from oldest to youngest. <laughs> I love this, right? Because here's, here's the reality. When you're young, you think you know everything. And when you get older, you realize you don't know everything, right? <laughs> and, it's, and, it's, and it's telling the story. It says oldest to youngest. Can you imagine this? Your mentors, if you're younger, you're, you're watching them walk out. You're, you're watching these, these individuals that begin to walk out. And I can only imagine there's a sound of rocks dropping. Thump, 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 thump. There's, there's maybe like a, a trail of rocks, or maybe there's, there's just rocks all over the place until only Jesus and the woman are there. Now, there is a chance the disciples are still there, but that's not what the, the scripture says. It's just the woman and Jesus that are now in this story. And I think that Jesus was trying to create behavior, trying to extend love by showing a, a different way of addressing this. He fronts love with them, but he also then uh, fronts love with this woman. See, I actually think we have a wonderful opportunity as a church, Big C Church, to be able to do something that's so radical with how we love individuals. You know, it's so quick that we can judge someone caught up in sexual sin. I've seen this time and again, but I've also seen it where people can engage and enter into relationship in ways that are so powerful. There's a story in a book called What's So Amazing About Grace. It's a book by Philip Yancey. It was written back in the 90s. But there's a story. The story, I think, begins the book, and it, it says uh, or it tells of a story uh, of a woman who had been a prostitute, was trying to get out of this lifestyle, and was talking to someone, and, and the, that someone said, you, you should really consider going to this church down the street. They, they have resources for you to get out of this lifestyle. And she said, why would I ever want to go to a place where I feel worse about myself? When I speak to a lot of friends who are lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. The place they long to be is in a church, but it's also the place they fear. I think if we can show radical love, if we can engage in such a way that we want to show Jesus' love, just like here, it can be a place of great healing. Uh, <laughs> I... I really think that we have to understand that our past can impact us, but it should not define us. That, that we are going to have scars from the past experiences that we've had, but it should not define us. What is our identity? Our identity is to be in Christ. That is the thing that is transforming. And here's the other thing. When we come to know Jesus, we have the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will lead a work of transformation, of change in our lives. And here's what I also recognize. So often we want to get in the way of the work of God. We want to correct someone's behavior. We say, hey, look, Scripture says you should be doing this. You're not doing that, right? Rather than saying, listen, I love you, and I'm going to trust the work of the Holy Spirit. And two people, same sin, person A, they could have a radical change overnight. Person B, it might not be for several years. But so often what we do is we get in the way of the change God wants to do in that person's life because we get in the way of the Holy Spirit. For me, the change that happened in my life was because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And it took people radically loving me, even in the midst of my mistakes, to, to be able to say, I love you. I love you. I think that we have a wonderful opportunity to experience and demonstrate and show this love with our brothers and sisters that are in the midst of this sin. And that sin can be so many different things. But Jesus fronted love. It's a part of the entire story, by the way. See, here's what happens with this topic of sex. So often what we do is we, we place it in, into two bubbles rather than the four bubbles, the four parts that we see in Scripture. See, all of Scripture, the story that you and I and everyone in here has been written into has four parts, creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And here's what we do. We so often place this topic of sex and a lot of other sin into only two parts, Fall and redemption. We start with seeing someone as a sinner and we frame our conversation around bad, don't do, right? But you have Jesus, yay, Jesus, right? You're forgiven. 
Ah, say, we start with seeing an individual first as a sinner and then seeing them made in the image of God. But here's the deal. That's not the whole story. The story starts with God's good intent. And then it moves to redemption. It moves to restoration. It's like watching a movie and starting 30 minutes late and ending 30 minutes early. Like, those are like the best parts. Like, you miss everything. It's not just what we're saved for or from. It's what we're saved for. And that's true for this conversation. Because in the very beginning, it was, it was all of creation made good. And then it comes to this place where humans are made and it's what? Very good. It goes from like a yay to like a woohoo, right? God plays great value on us. See, we were made in the image of God, and then, yes, sin entered the picture. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing as he's fronting with love. He recognizes that this woman is made in the very image of God. But we have to realize this. See, what can happen is we can have the story stop there. It does happen a lot in church culture today. We, we front with love, but we forget about this thing called truth. And Jesus always spoke truth. But as we fix our eyes on God, there is something beautiful that happens. Grace and truth are revealed. Truth and grace are revealed. They work hand in hand. And that's exactly what Jesus is doing. As he is extending radical grace, he's also extending radical truth. Because it says this, picking back up in verse 11. No one, sir, was there anyone there to condemn you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. No condemnation in Christ. Paul writes about this to the Romans. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Real quick, think about your own stuff. Had Jesus or someone just simply said, stop doing it bad and not throwing the stone, would that have been as effective as someone just embracing or loving you or humbling themselves and getting lower than you? allowing you to be seen and to be heard. I think it's in the second aspect that you would actually then want to hear what they have to say. If they knew that you loved them and, and were there for them, you were their cheerleader, that you were willing to humble yourself so that they might be propped up and to come and know Jesus in a radical way. I mean, I have to believe that when this woman leaves, her life is radically changed. That stoning, it might have been like a, 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 a very short fix, but this, this was leading to a heart change. It wasn't leading to a behavior change. Behavior change lasts a few, few, few minutes, lasts a few days, lasts a few weeks. We can white knuckle change. I'm going to do it, right? That's different than, Lord, I love you. I am so grateful for you. You know, in my own life, it wasn't until I came to the place where I knew I was loved by Jesus. I was loved, I was known, that I actually began to live into his truth. As his grace fell upon me, I wanted to live into his truth. That is exactly what we see here. Let me say this. So often what happens is we can believe that... that, that uh, that God actually doesn't speak much, or specifically Jesus doesn't speak much about this topic of sex. In fact, um, I was in New York one time, and I had gotten done doing a parenting workshop. Someone had come up and said, you know, there's someone that's going to be planning a church here, and they've chosen to not talk about sex at all. What do you think about that? And I was like, well, why are they not doing that? And they said, well, because Jesus didn't speak about sex. And I was like, what? That's just not true. I mean, that's just not true. Jesus didn't just not speak about sex. He actually raises the bar. Matthew 5, verses 27 through 28. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Wow. Like, you went from the physical to now the heart and the mind. Like, he didn't lower the bar. He raised it. And we cannot do this alone. It requires community. It requires Jesus. It requires the relationship that we were meant to have. But then let me come to later uh, in Matthew. Matthew 19. It says this. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he left Galilee, went into the region of Judea, to the other side of the Jordan. Large crowds followed him, and he healed them there. And then it continues. Some Pharisees came to him to test him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for every and any reason? And then he says, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? This is directly out of Genesis 1.27. And then it goes further and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. 
and the two will become one flesh. This is uh, directly uh, from Genesis 2, 24. Uh, I mean, you could include 24, 25, but, but it's, he's quoting the Old Testament. He's quoting the very beginning of Scripture. He's quoting the very first panel of the story that we have been written into. Creation. And I think its purpose is to point us forward. But then he continues. So they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore, this is the words of Jesus. He is now adding. He is now uh, proclaiming something upon what, what was found in the Old Testament. Therefore, what God is joined together, let no one separate. Those are the words of Jesus. Jesus is not silent on this. I really believe this, that if we can come to a place where we um, are able to experience the humility and acceptance in Jesus, that that becomes our identity that allows us to move into a place where we can experience and humble ourselves and admit to the mistakes that we've made. I think that that then moves us to a place where we can not only experience the, the powerful love of Jesus, but it propels us to then show others this great love. I know that in my own life, the reason I engage and encounter and equip others to speak the way I do is because of this, the grace and the love and the humility that I found in Scripture and experienced in my own uh, recommitment to the Lord. But then we come to this. Jesus always spoke truth. And see, it's in that truth that we find belonging, we find meaning, we find understanding, and it's in that that moves us to want to change our life, to live in obedience. That is what we have the opportunity to do. That is what we see modeled here. I think it's an opportunity for us as a church to model something that is radically different than the rest of the world offers. I want to say this. Um, there are some great resources. I will list a few, um, but I want for you to understand that there are many resources for you. If you're in the midst of this, this journey, if you're wanting to even find out how you then, maybe it's not you, maybe it's how you equip your children, maybe it's how you equip a friend. There are some great resources. These are just but a few. The first is our own website, project619.org. Uh, we have free downloads. We have podcasts. If you're a parent, uh, it's called Drive Time. If you're a young adult, we call it's called Mixtape. We are getting get ready to release a new uh, series of each here in the next month, uh, two months. Our next Drive Time series for parents will be on pornography. The next one for Mixtape, we're actually going to go through God's story. We're going to have um, four series over the course of this rest of the rest of this year called Creation, Fall, Redemption, Restoration, and they're, they're stories from others and then us uh, equipping young adults in, in the midst of these conversations. Uh, I also want to point to the Sexual Integrity Initiative.org. Uh, it's a partnership with a great organization that we do a lot of work with called Center for Parent and Youth Understanding. It's a great resource, cpyu.org. But there you can find even more downloads and resources and just keep up with news that's happening around this. If you have a teen or if you have uh, a grandchild and you just want to hear a little bit about what's happening, we have uh, links to news stories, blogs, and other things. If you find yourself or someone you know in the midst of uh, uh, habitually looking at pornography, Covenant Eyes is a great resource for both filters and tools. Uh, it also has downloads, uh, free resources, reads that might help you. Um, one of the things I will say with pornography, um, the best way, the, the most powerful way, and the way that most people get free from it having an impact on their life is having a clear action plan, and Covenant Eyes will help with that. And then I'll say Triple uh, X Church is also a great resource, more tools, uh, more accountability software. They consider themselves the largest Christian porn site um, in the world. Um, there's no porn. Uh, it's actually meant to help you remove yourself from that, but they, they, uh, they, uh, it's a catchy title, but it's actually great resources that, that are there for you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here. It is, it is a great privilege, and I hope that with this, that you find yourselves going from stuck uh, to getting unstuck specifically around this topic. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be a part of this.